glad you guys uh, are here with us as we start this new series. Uh, th there's an old saying, uh, and it's that to know where you're going, you, you have to know where you're coming from. Uh, you, you'll hear that a lot amongst different businesses and, and, and corporations and, and, and organizations and even churches will we'll talk about that a lot uh, as a means of, of explaining that, that your past plays a large role in, in shaping your future. Um, and and that, that, that phrase, that, that mantra, uh, it actually applies very heavily to, to where we're going today, the beginning of this journey into the Sermon on the Mount, to, to truly understand what Christ was unpacking for these early followers in, in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. We, we have to understand where he's come from. And, and though we're starting in Matthew chapter 5, only five Five chapters into this book, a lot has already taken place. Uh, Matthew begins his gospel with, with a genealogy. Now, we, we've talked about genealogies a lot uh, throughout some recent series, and, and we've kind of painted them in, in bad light as, as if they're boring and, you know, not, not super exciting because they're, they're just big long lists of names. But, but Matthew's genealogy actually is pretty interesting. He, he, he dates back uh, Christ's lineage all the way back to, to Abraham. And, and, and the thing about genealogies back then is, is typically Typically, it was your opportunity to kind of boast about your family, to, to kind of boast about your bloodline. So when you presented a genealogy, it was kind of like the highlight reel of your family's heritage, but, but, but Christ's genealogy in Matthew is, is far from a highlight reel. In fact, it, it includes, you know, such, such individuals as Rahab the prostitute. It, it mentions an affair, and there's several unlikely characters spattered throughout this genealogy, and Matthew very much does that on purpose. Matthew wants to articulate that Christ comes from a very broken road, and it's a reminder that, that Christ isn't just calling us out of a mess. Christ has come into our mess to lead us out of that mess. And, and so that's how Matthew begins everything, by, by, by showing the, the painful road that Christ comes from. And then he, he kind of dives in to, to Christ's birth, like the, the, the amazing circumstances that, that surrounded it. Um, he, he follows most of, of Christ's birth and his early childhood uh, through the lens of, of Joseph. Um, and then he moves uh, the, the focus to John the Baptist and how John the Baptist was preparing the way for Christ. And, and Christ actually doesn't take spotlight until a little ways into to John, uh, to Matthew chapter three, uh, the day that he was baptized. So John the Baptist is baptizing people uh, in the Jordan River and, and Christ comes one day to be baptized. And immediately like John is resistant, like he says, like I shouldn't be baptizing you you should be baptizing me. But, but then Christ says this in Matthew chapter three, verse 15. He says, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. Uh, what Matthew is displaying here is the firm commitment to obedience that, that Christ consistently displayed. But he's also pointing to the clear connection between Christ's obedience and his righteousness. And this is significant because those, those were two hot topics amongst the Jews. They, they had long since understood that, that in order to please God and thereby receive God's favor, this was the cost, your obedience and your righteousness. These were the things you must do. And, and what Christ seems to be saying to John is very much in line with that. I am doing this. I, I am participating in this act to please God and, and do what is expected of me. And this to me, seems to be further illustrated by, by what happens next. Diving into verse 16, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I love and with him I am well 
pleased. It, it worked. Like, like Christ did what God expected of him. He, he was obedient. It led to righteousness. And God is already affirming, I am very, very pleased with my son. And so he seems to be affirming what the Jews had long since believed. If you can pull off obedience, if you can pull off righteousness, God has to like you. If you do this, this, and this, God will be pleased with you. But then something very unexpected happened that changes everything. With, with the newfound presence of the Holy Spirit in his life, Christ is immediately led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. So away from, from all possible crowds, away from all civilization, he's led into the wilderness with the divine purpose of being tempted for 40 days. For 40 days he fasted and he was attacked by the devil. And the devil ultimately leaned into three separate temptations. One was because Christ had been fasting for so long, he, he tempted him to use his power to turn stones into bread to, to feed himself. Then he took him to the top uh, of the temple and, and he told him, jump off. Scripture says, if you do something like that, angels will come to your aid. If angels come to your aid, everybody will take notice of you. Everybody will listen to you. Everybody will follow you. And that's what you want, right? You want a following. And then, and then he takes him to the top of a mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, here's the deal. I will give up all of those. You can have them if you will just stay up here and worship me. Now, now to take one of the most complex passages in all of the gospels and to drastically simplify it, here was Satan's goal. Satan attempted to tempt Christ to take as many shortcuts as he possibly could. But each and every time Christ resisted, and instead, he leaned further and further into dependence on the presence of his father. And what that displays, what, what that displays in the wilderness and out of the wilderness would come to define Christ's entire earthly ministry. And, it, and it's simply this, that, that obedience and righteousness are anchored in dependence rather than performance. You see, the Jews, they had all these rules, all this stuff that if we do this, it's gonna to equate to obedience, it's gonna to equate to righteousness, and then God is going to be pleased with us. But what Christ displays is that obedience is the process of honing righteousness. Righteousness, the ability to do right, is what garners the blessing of God. But all of that is founded in dependence on God, leaning further and further into the presence of God. You can't have obedience and righteousness, and thereby you can't have the blessing of God without the presence of God. And so Jesus begins to display this, this understanding this reality that what God cares most about when it comes to you is not necessarily simply the things you do. It's who you are. God cares most deeply about the health of your heart rather than the polished shine of your behavior. And a pure heart and good character can only be fueled by a closeness to the Father. And that's what Christ displayed. And that's what Christ began investing in those around him. Matthew then tells us that, that propelled out of the wilderness, Christ began to preach. And, and the early theme uh, of his preaching, at least as the Gospels seem to indicate, was the, the prophetic book of Isaiah, a book that pointed ahead to the future Messiah, everything that he would be, but everything he would accomplish, the new realities that he would bring. And so this is what Christ was preaching about that this was being fulfilled here and now and each and every time he preached regardless of who he was preaching to it seemed to always lead to the same challenge repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near and we talk about this a lot but repent means to turn it's to feel remorse for an action or behavior and make the conscious decision to turn away from it and turn towards something better. And Christ is, is very much turning people from their old way of life, from their old way of thinking, from their old way of being and turning them towards something better. And this begins to generate a lot of buzz. Like people start to get pretty excited about this. People are taking notice to the things that Christ are saying. Ears are perking up. I mean, these connections between what Isaiah said long ago and what this guy is now saying, like it's got everybody paying attention. It's in the midst of that, that, that Christ starts to recruit 
He starts grabbing specific people and inviting them to walk a little bit more closely with him. There would come to be 12 of these guys in total, but we know them as the disciples. And so Jesus handpicks each of these guys. They're very unlikely characters. They're not the people anyone would have expected to be chosen for something like this. But Christ chooses them and he calls them to follow them. And he gives them a front row seat, not just to hear everything he's saying, but to see everything he begins to do. And this is what they begin to see. Matthew tells us about it in chapter four, verses 23 through 25. It says, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria and, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed. And he healed them all. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Crowds begin to form, an immense amount of excitement begins to build because of what Christ can do. And so now not only is he saying stuff that's, that's garnering attention, not only is he saying stuff that's causing people's ears to perk up, but he's backing it up by doing stuff they've never seen before. The very stuff that prophets like Isaiah said eventually would start happening. He, he seems to be fully filling the shoes of what the Messiah is supposed to to be. And so people start getting really, really excited about that in crowds. They just start to form everywhere Christ goes. But then Christ does something very unexpected and that he steps away from those crowds. Now, anybody who has ever built a movement with, with any form of intentionality in place would tell you that as you start to develop buzz, as you start to develop excitement, you lean into that, you ride that lightning, but, but Christ, he steps away from it. And he takes a, a group of followers, and, and scholars debate how many that was. Many scholars will tell you it, it was just the 12. Some will say it was a group a little bit larger than that. It could have been anywhere from you know, a few dozen to maybe about 50. Some even say it was a couple hundred. Ultimately, it doesn't matter how many of them there were. What matters is who they were. And they were the ones who, who were not merely watching, but were also listening. And they were the ones that were, were not just simply being drawn to a spectacle of what Christ could do, but were rather leaning into the truth that what he could do was demonstrating, leaning into the truth that he was consistently proclaiming, truth that requires a response. These were the ones who were responding, who were beginning to take steps towards giving their lives to this movement, giving their lives to this truth. And, and, and Christ wants a few quiet moments with these people, people who have responded to hope, and are ready to begin living in that hope and become ambassadors of that hope. This, this would eventually become known as the church, the, the very thing that we are now a part of, those who follow Christ. And so Christ takes these followers, however many of them there were, and, and they go up a mountain. It, it was really more of a hill. And it was somewhere on the side of that mountain that he sits them all down and he goes, okay, here's what you've signed up for. Here's what you've begun giving your life to, and, and here's what it will mean to go all in. Here is what will be expected of you. Here is who you are now being called to be. Here is who you were created to be. And Matthew tells us that he opened his mouth and began to teach them. And, and what he started with was the very passage that you heard at the beginning of our teaching time. It's a section of scripture that we've come to know as the Beatitudes. And Beatitudes just simply mean statements of blessings. These can be understood as promises, uh, but, but they're better understood as invitations. These represent eight shifts that must take place in our lives to further step into the presence of God and experience the blessings of doing life with him. 
And there are eight very powerful shifts that, that take place in our lives. And Christ wants to begin to invest these in the lives of these believers. And he'll very much build on this foundation of these eight truths throughout the rest of this sermon. Now, like I said, the early preaching of Christ seems to be most regularly anchored in, in the book of Isaiah. And that, that proves to be true uh, with, with these Beatitudes. In fact, the first three Beatitudes come straight from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61 verses one through three specifically says this, spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now, understanding that the first three statements are anchored in this passage changes the way we may initially read them. Uh, we realize that, that Christ is describing a particular demeanor, but, but we quickly realize that it's a demeanor that he has had on full display all along. This is the demeanor that, that, that Christ has displayed before these very people. And now that the call to being blessed, uh, the call that the blessed will be those who are poor in spirit is a call to the same full dependence that Christ has already displayed. Specifically, the full the dependence that he displayed in the wilderness. It's the acknowledgement that if I don't have the presence of God in my life, then I have nothing and therefore, I will cherish and desire the presence of God above all else. The word that Christ uses for poor, there, there were several variations of this word in, in their common language. But the particular word that he uses was a word used to describe destitute poverty. What Christ is saying is you will be blessed when you consider yourself spiritually and physically bankrupt outside of your relationship with God. When you find a level of dependence on the Father that acknowledges that nothing else in this world can bring me fulfillment, nothing else in this world can bring me security, nothing else in this world can sustain me, that's when you'll find the full blessing of God's presence. And that's when you will feel most like a citizen of his kingdom. And then he promises the same level of blessing for those who mourn. Now, the promise for those who mourn uh, and will be comforted is often misunderstood as a promise that God will be close to us in our times uh, of trouble and tribulation. And though that's very much true, that's not the spirit of this beatitude. Uh, remember, Isaiah prophesied that comfort would come to those who, who were captives and who were prisoners. And we must stop and ask, what were they captives and prisoners of? What were they being restored from? What were they being released from? It was sin. And remember, the, the challenge that came out of all of Christ's early preaching was to repent, to turn from your sin. Christ is inviting those who have realized the depth of their sin and the distance it creates between them and God, who have acknowledged that their sin breaks God's heart to respond by mourning over it themselves and experiencing the overwhelming blessing of feeling God's comfort and forgiveness as they continue to move away from that sin. Again, it's a drawing into the presence of God. I have nothing apart from God, and I feel the full comfort of acknowledging that it's my sin that had kept me from him before, and I'm trusting him to deal with that sin as only he can. It breaks my heart that it broke his heart, but God is now intimately putting my heart back together because of my proximity to him. And then, then Christ turns his focus to the blessing of the meek. The meek will inherit the earth, he says. Why? Be because the resulting demeanor 
uh, of someone who understands that they are spiritually and physically bankrupt without the presence of God in their lives. And those who have allowed their hearts to be broken by their own sin as they turn back to God is a demeanor of humility. Understanding that any good that comes from me, me is not because of me. It's because I am rooted in the source of life. And you remember way back in the beginning when Adam and Eve were created and God said it, it is all very, very good. They, they were given a divine purpose, a divine work. And what was that divine purpose and that divine work? It was to oversee creation, to cultivate it and protect it and even to enhance it. And what Christ is very much saying in this beatitude is when you take on this demeanor of humility because, because you're making your way back to God and you're acknowledging that any good in you is coming from him, you, you are enabled to step back into that divine purpose as being someone who can be trust, entrusted to oversee creation, to cultivate it, to protect it, and to enhance it. And that's a beautiful reality. And this is unleashing a beautiful reality. And that's only the first three the, the next four are, are very, very closely reated. Christ calls us to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, and to be peacemakers. Still, he, he carries with each of these invitations uh, to uh, a quality and understanding that it brings a certain amount of blessing into our lives. These four qualities lead to full lives, to being shown mercy, to seeing God, and being declared as his children. I, I think one of the things that stands stands out the most as, as you work your way through the Beatitudes is how the life that Christ is building, this, this good life that he is being, in, that we are being invited into, how much it contrasts with our world's version of the good life. And we see depictions of this life all the time. Like, like you turn on the TV, you don't have to watch for very long. Every single show, uh, every single commercial, the movies we watch, they all offer these bold depictions of what the good life really is. And, and typically the media's version of the good life is one marked by luxury and relaxation, low expectations and self-focused freedoms. I do what I want and I can have what I want. And in these portrayals, uh, we, we are encouraged not to hunger and thirst for righteousness, but to hunger and thirst for what makes us feel good. We encourage to show favoritism and partiality rather than mercy. We define the health of our hearts based on what we want and who we want to be. And it's not our job to bring peace in this good life. It's simply our job to enjoy it. And Christ didn't have TV and commercials and movies in mind when, when he was investing this in those early followers. That, that's absolutely true. But, but the concepts and the realities, they were very much the same then as they are now. That, that, that a choice needed to be made. Society, even back then, was peddling a lie. This is the best life possible and this is how you get it. You go and you take it. You become more selfish you become more self-reliant. You become more closed off from others. You take and you take and you take as much as you possibly can. And then you will be fulfilled. Then you will be content. When you have, you will be happy. And our world very much tells us the exact same thing. And ultimately what Christ was presenting, Christ was presenting an opportunity to make a decision. What will you believe? Will you continue to believe what I'm telling you here and now is a lie? Or will you trust me in the truth that the best life possible doesn't come about by taking? Best life possible does, doesn't come about by accumulating. Best life possible doesn't come by having and holding. It comes from letting go, from laying down your life, entrusting it to your heavenly father and allowing him to become the author and the perfecter of it. Christ is being as clear as he possibly can with these early followers. You have a decision to make and the best life possible can only be found in the arms of my father. And that's what he intended to continue to tell them about. But as he, he makes that transition, moving from these 
blessing statements to, to kind of practical teaching on how do we do this. He shares one more beatitude, and it's the one he goes into the most, uh, uh, most detail on. You see, Christ has already begun to articulate that, that in order to experience the presence of God in our lives, we have to be willing to give that up. We have to be able, willing to lay down our lives. But within that sacrifice, there are several other sacrifices. There are a multitude of things you will have to lay down. You have to lay down your pride. Uh, you'll have to lay down your fear. You'll have to lay down your doubts. But there is one thing nestled within that sacrifice that may be harder than all the other things that we have to lay down because we've been taught for so long to protect it at all costs and that's your comfort and this good life it comes at a very very high cost and make no mistake any way you slice it your comfort will be required and this is how Christ closes out the Beatitudes verses 10 through 12 he says this blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven Blessed are you when when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. First, let's let's remember that, that Christ closes with this promise. He didn't open with it. And that's significant because that tells us that all the other invitations and their corresponding reward and blessing are still in play even if persecution happens. Okay, so this isn't a situation where Christ is saying, okay, you got to get through a whole bunch of persecution, but take heart on the other side of it is all this blessing. No, he articulated all that other blessing first, indicating that even in the midst of persecution, all that stuff is possible. Even in the midst of persecution, we can rest assured that we are citizens of the kingdom. Even in the midst of persecution, we can be comforted. Even in the midst of persecution, we have purpose and we can be fulfilled and we'll be shown mercy and we can see God through Christ. And we are his beloved children and he is still close to us. All of these realities are intact, even and especially when this world attacks us. This world can say and do a lot of things, but it cannot touch your soul. And it does not get to author your eternity. Only God does that. Second thing I think we need to notice about this promise of persecution is that we must remember where Christ has come from as we follow him where he is going. Christ is not calling us to weather anything that he has not already walked through. And not only has he walked through it, but he has also overcome it. We reiterate this all the time, but but walking with Jesus Christ makes you a member of the family of God and no one in the family of God ever has to walk alone. We walk with a capable and powerful savior and we walk arm in arm with each other. No one is ever alone. And when the world attacks you, you don't have to weather that storm by yourself. And then finally, lastly, You and I have an even greater advantage than those early followers did. And those early followers had a great advantage. Christ reminds these early followers that their persecution relates to the prophets of old who also faced persecution. And he wanted them to make a very, very important connection. Remember the old prophets. You you remember the things they said. You remember the things they've done. You've been leaning into their words. You've been hanging on the promises that God spoke through them. Remember them. Remember the difficulty that they faced. Many of them lost their lives because of what they were doing for God's kingdom. But most importantly, remember the message they spoke, that hope was coming. And that it would be ushered in and carried on the back of a Messiah. And what Christ was saying to these early followers is he's standing right in front of you. Think about the things you've heard me say. Think about the things you've seen me do. I am him. And so those prophets who took courage in what God was going to do, you can now take courage in what you're seeing happen here and now. But you and I, we can take courage in the fact that it is finished. 
Last week, we, we gathered together to celebrate Easter. We, we gathered together to celebrate the resurrection. We gathered together to celebrate an empty tomb. And we made the bold declaration that not only is that tomb empty, but it will never be filled again. And that truth, that reality, it changes everything. And the celebration that that ignites, it's unlike anything you and I will ever experience that's what heaven's going to be. It's an ongoing celebration. The fact that the tomb is empty, that death has no sting, that we are alive. And it's all because of Jesus Christ. It's all because of the love of our Father. And that's a reality, a reality that we now live in. And that reality should change everything. But the unfortunate reality is that it often doesn't. There was a whole lot of people gathered in our church last week that heard about hope, hope that, that deserves and requires a response. And, and the grim reality is that many of those people walked away and their lives were completely unaffected by that hope. The grim reality is that on a day-to-day -day basis, those of us who know the hope of Jesus Christ still make the conscious decision to stumble around with our eyes closed. Years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to, to cross paths with a missionary named Robert. Um, we actually became really, really good friends. We, we shared a season of ministry together where, where we were both missionaries in Northern Ireland. I'm obviously from the United States, but Robert, Robert was from Jamaica. And Robert had done a tremendous uh, amount of ministry in Jamaica amongst the, the third world population in Jamaica. Jamaica's kind of a complicated place. You have very much, you know, aspects that are very much third world, some that are developing world. Obviously, it's a great, you know, uh, tourist destination. And so you have, you know, luxury in the midst of all of that. And so it's, it's a complicated place. But Robert had, had done ministry there for years uh, amongst a, a very impoverished population. And Robert was always telling us the craziest stories uh, about mission, ministry in Jamaica. He, he would tell stories about demon possession. And he would tell stories about seeing people raised from the dead. He'd just tell us crazy stories. And all of them seemed to share these elaborate ways that the enemy would try to distract and disrupt the work of the local church. And I'm ashamed to admit that early on, as I was first getting to know Robert, he'd tell these crazy stories in the back of my head, I'm like, that ain't true. There's no way that actually happened. Like there's a, there's a logical explanation for that. Like I, I very much fell into this line of thinking that if I haven't personally seen it in life, then it can't be true anywhere else. But, but I was young at the time. I, I lacked experience. But the more I got to know Robert, the more I began to truly trust his convictions. And the more I was drawn into what he was talking about, I became more and more curious. And then one night, one night, a group of us was hanging out, all people who were doing mission work in various forms. Most of us were either from the United States or from around the United Kingdom. And Robert was the only one that was from Jamaica. He was also the only one that was from either a developing or third world country. The rest of us very much from the first world. And so I saw this as an opportunity to ask Robert a question that I had been mulling over for some time. I looked at him I said, Robert, let me ask you, you know, you tell us these crazy stories. Why is it that we so often hear those stories from third world countries and the developing world, but we so seldom see that stuff in the first world? Because it's not just Jamaica that I've heard those stories from, Robert. Like I have friends who've done mission work in Haiti and parts of Africa, and they tell me the same stories, but I've never seen it where I come from. And Robert looked at us and he said, well, there's actually two reasons. And the, and the first one has nothing to do with, with where you are or what type of country it is. The, the fact of the matter is many people, even in Jamaica, don't see this stuff because their eyes are closed. They don't see it because they don't want to see it. He says, so you got to start by, by, you know, checking your own heart and making sure, am I even willing to see this? Am I even willing to see this aspect of God's kingdom? He said, but then there, there is a, a very real difference between what the enemy does in the third world and what the enemy does in, in the places that you come from. And he looked at us with, with eyes that were absolutely filled with compassion. I, I tell you, there, there was not the slightest presence of judgment. And from his vast experience, he said, Here, here's what I've come to understand. In the third world, 
Most people have, have little to nothing. Some have absolutely nothing. And so they can confidently tell you, if they're a believer, God is the only thing I have. There, there's nothing else. It's just him. And for the enemy to convince those people to willingly let go of the only thing they have, he has to go to elaborate measures. He said, however, in the places that you were from, the enemy doesn't have to invest a lot of time and energy into distracting you. Because far too often you do a really, really good job of distracting yourselves. And this was sobering. And it was convicting. And I also understand that, you know, today, like, I think it's worth noting, you don't know Robert. Okay, you, you didn't have the opportunity to get to know him. Uh, you, you weren't sitting at that table with us that night. You, you certainly don't know his heart. You've just heard a story that I've told about him. And so I fully understand that, that what Robert had to say that night likely lands in a lot of different ways in a room like this. Some of you immediately feel judged. Some of you immediately feel like those comments are unfair. Some of you immediately would dismiss it and say, oh, he's jealous. Or he doesn't get it. He doesn't know me. That is absolutely true. All, all of those reactions are, are fair and understandable. And, and so know that, that Robert's not here today challenging you. I'm challenging you. And here's what I would challenge you to do. Rather than dismiss those comments, spend some time dealing with them. Here's what I mean by that. Rather than immediately you spend time convincing yourself that that can't possibly be true about you. And admittedly, I, 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 my, my compulsion was to immediately do that. As Robert said that, immediately in my head, I started going, well, that ain't me. So don't do that. Instead, create some space, some, some quiet space. And ask God what he thinks about it. Simply pray this prayer, Lord, am I distracted? And he'll tell you. And if God tells you, nope, you're not, you're killing it. Fantastic. Like, keep going. That's awesome. Like, this series is going to be a breeze for you. You'll easily apply all this truth, and we will all just follow your lead. But if God says, yeah, you are. Maybe he says, yeah, you, a little bit. Or maybe he says, nope, a lot of bit. Well, this series is for you. And here's what I'll tell you. I am certain this series is for me. I'm excited about, about what God's gonna do on this journey. Not because it's gonna feel good all the time, but because on the other side of this truth is who you and I were created to be. And I'm excited to get there. But, but remember, remember this statement as we walk through this series. Obedience and righteousness are anchored in dependence rather than performance, this series, this, this truth that we're gonna walk through, Christ's intent for us is very much the same as Christ's intent for those followers back then. This, this is meant to transform us, but not merely to transform our behavior. We are gonna live differently after we encounter truth like this, but God's number one priority in this is to transform your hearts, to shape it, to refine it, but most importantly, to draw it into his presence so on a day by day moment by moment basis he can continue to define it and so that's the journey that that's where we're headed and that's what begins today so let me pray for us as as we take this journey together father god we thank you so much for that truth god we thank you so much for your goodness we thank you so much for your patience god that you patiently walk beside us as, as we stumble through this life attempting to open our eyes Lord, you have sent Jesus Christ to remove the sin barrier, to conquer death, and bring the power and the truth that allows us to see. And so, Father God, I pray you give us eyes to see in this series. I pray you give us ears to hear. I pray you give us a heart that is willing to be open to your presence. And then I pray that you transform our lives as only you can, that we might become who you created us to be so that we might do what you created your church to do, to share hope with a world that desperately needs it. 
So Lord, we entrust all of this to you as we start this journey together. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.